You're in tune with Radio 2 on 693 and 909 kilohertz. Here with the very latest news are the news headlines starring Roy Hudd with Chris Emmett, Alison Stedman and the Hudliners. Well, thank you very much indeed, folks, and welcome to the show. Yes, the show that does for politicians what the Romans did to Britain. <laughs> well, what's been happening since we've been away? Erica Rowe. Remember them? <laughs> I bet you can't remember who won the match either, can you? Nor can I. And I see they've now brought out the Erica Rowe inflatable doll. <laughs> yes. The only trouble is, by the time you finish blowing it up, you're too knackered to do anything with it. <laughs> Well, there was good news and bad news for commuters, eh? The good news was, for the first time ever, British Rail provided a service that was 100% reliable. The bad news was it was when they were on strike. <laughs> and over three million angry and unhappy souls joined the queue for a miserable payout from the Daily Mail casino competition. <laughs> but this week I read that where Prince Charles spent a day at the Foreign Office to see how government works, then a day at the Job Centre to see how it doesn't. <laughs> Mark Thatcher, the rich man Stan Ogden. <laughs> oh, Mark says people should get up off their behinds. Well, he has to, otherwise you can't understand what he's saying, can you? <laughs> yes, I think so. And I see British Telecom have cut 35% off long-distance phone calls. So now when you dial Glasgow, you get Manchester. <laughs> And Michael Foote was first in the queue at the Ideal Home Exhibition. Mm -hmm. Somebody told him it was full of labour-saving devices. <laughs> well, right. And I see Biella bringing out a new model to celebrate the birth of the royal baby. Yes, with a built-in rattle. <laughs> <laughs> did you read that someone's found that fabulous golden hair at last? But he's decided to send it back to Michael Heseltine. <laughs> Oh, and what did I see on page three of The Sun this week, eh? A picture of Arthur Scargill. <laughs> yes. Imagine that, three on one page. <laughs> <laughs> then there's Ray Buckton, the one-man chat show. <laughs> I see he stopped The Sun being delivered. None of his members could understand it, but there we are. <laughs> and, and Carol Thatcher, radio's answer to Tommy Doherty. <laughs> She's revealed she keeps cardboard cutouts of her mum. <laughs> she reckons there's only one way you can tell the difference. Maggie's real hair is a lot stiffer. <laughs> and what about that Englishman in Reno, eh? Who won 150,000 quid just by dropping a coin into a machine, eh? He says he was very surprised at the win. He was only expecting black tea with no sugar. <laughs> Turning to the showbiz pages, I see they're looking for a replacement for Michael Parkinson. He'll have to be lightweight and strictly non-political. Yes, but will Roy Jenkins do it? I ask myself. <laughs> but what about all this fuss about breakfast telly? You know, the unemployed already have it. It's called Pebble Mill at One. <laughs> There's a terrible financial crisis place in football clubs. Yes, apparently Chelsea tried to sell their entire playing staff last week. But they couldn't get an offer from the glue factory. <laughs> Finally, what about that young miner who's given up his job because of an underground ghost? Yes, he says it's really scared the pit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see at last Joe Gormley has done something to please the Yorkshire miners, eh? He's retired. <laughs> so to mark the occasion, we present the Gormley story. Oh, mind your own business. <laughs> Joe Gormley was born in 1918, but after negotiations, he got this increase to 1922. <laughs> His father went down the mine every day, being a steeplejack with no sense of direction. <laughs> Joe himself left school at four to go down the pit, but he was up again by 4.15. <laughs> hey, Mum, Mum, I don't like it down the pit. Just told you, noise our Joe. If Pete's good enough for their father, it's good enough for thee. But I want to be a peer in House of Lords. You? Uh, the nearest you'll get to a peer is if you go to Blackpool. Now eat the tea. That's another thing, ma'am. 
Why do I have to eat lumps of coke? I've told you before, we can't afford anthracite. <laughs> yes, for Joe, life was hard. He'd come home every night, have a hot bath, and still be covered in grime. Mum, I wish you'd take the coals out to bath worse. <laughs> but down the pit, his fellow workers sensed there was something different about Joe. Hey, Joe, lad, over here. Hey, that's a great mining helmet you got. It's a bit bright, though. How do you mean? They've all got lamps on. Aye, but not chandeliers. Before long, Joe's endeavours in the union won him the post of president of the NUM, and it seemed only a matter of time before he'd endure a face-to-face -face confrontation with the scourge of Barnsley. But Joe steadfastly refused to appear on Parkinson. <laughs> Instead, he withstood the wrath of Arthur Scargill. Joe Gormley, you are a traitor to the union, a hypocrite obsessed by material wealth, and as a committed socialist myself, I have only one thing to say. What? That's the last time you ride in my jag. <laughs> but now, as retirement stretches before him, does Joe have any regrets? I already I missed fellowship of pitch. As a working man, retirement is an empty road for me. Mind you, when I look at my company car, my union-owned luxury flat, and my 30 grand golden handshake, it still feels as if I'm in mine. Oh, a ruddy gold mine. <laughs> Mister, come over here, into this doorway. <laughs> you, uh, you talking to me? Yes, yes, quick, quick, over here in this doorway. Oh, all right. <laughs> What do you want? I want to give you pleasure. <laughs> An excitement you never dreamed possible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want you to come with me to experience a day packed full of action and an incredible night of nights. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know what I mean, don't you? Of course, you're taking me to the Barbican. <laughs> And I see there's a new report out this week which claims the British will eat just about anything that's put in front of them. Yes, sir, can I help you? Yes, uh, can I order the uh, minced flank of badger with the special rat lung sauce glistening with dog saliva and garnished with the succulent juices of an orangutan's armpit <laughs> served between two toasted cowpats, please. Yes, sir. What relish would you like? Uh, the African elephant earwax <laughs> with herring spit and crispy polar bear bogies, please. Certainly, sir. So eat in or take away? Uh, take away. Yes, sir. I'll get one giant burger. Take away. <laughs> And this week, too, sees the start of the vital rail tribunal talks at which Aslef and British Rail finally agree to sit down under Lord McCarthy <laughs> to sort out their differences over driver's pay and flexible rostering. Very well, then, Mr. Buckton. I've heard your union side, so now let's hear what Sir Peter Parker's negotiators have to say for British Rail in reply. Sir Peter? <laughs> Sir Peter? British Rail would like to apologise for the late arrival of Sir Peter Parker, which has been caused by circumstances beyond our control. Well, while we've been away, we've had the train driver's strike. That meant for two days every week, nobody was late for work. <laughs> and the government even encouraged car sharing. Mind you, we've had car sharing round our way for years. Park in our road and somebody has your tyres and somebody else has your battery. <laughs> But there were so many novel ways of getting to work. I wonder if anyone will bother to use the trains in future. With his briefcase underneath his arm, he haunts the railway station. With his briefcase underneath his arm, causing consternation. He wanted to get home, but all the drivers were on strike. He kept inside a wagon 
because it was far too far to hike. And unlike Norman Tebbit's dad, he hadn't got a bike with his briefcase underneath his arm. With his briefcase underneath his arm in the WC he was hiding. But he woke locked in with much alarm, shunted in a siding. And no one hears his cries for help. His fate was rather grim. And now he haunts the platforms when the lights are getting dim. He's looking for Ray Buckton to do the same to him with his briefcase underneath his arm. Morning, darling. Uh, uh. I've brought you a cup of tea. Nice lying. Not bad. Oh, what was all that noise? Oh, sorry about that. Did it disturb you? Uh, Simon made some foul liquid with his chemistry set and Annabelle shampooed the cat with it. Uh, no harm done, though. Most of it washed off when the baby tried to flush the cat down the loo. Oh, I I've unblocked the loo, by the way. Uh, th then they dried it out with my heated electric rollers. Quite enterprising of them, really. And it only took a jiffy to mend the fuses afterwards. Oh, yeah. What a morning, eh? Must rush. Oh, I, ju I just came up to say, if you want me, I'll be outside with the children laying the new drive. All right. Oh, I almost forgot, darling. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> and I see the police are having problems because of a shortage of panda cars. Apparently, they're having to answer some 999 calls using other modes of transport. <laughs> Can't you pedal a bit faster, PC Lomax? <laughs> I can't pedal and make the siren noise, Sarge. Well, never mind. We're here now. Lean the bike against them railings and follow me. Yes, Sarge. Excuse me, miss. Yes, officer? I understand there's been a robbery. What? Round here? What's the first I've heard of it? Oh, blimey, you must have heard of it. It was a real big one. Two and a half million quid was nicked. Well, the only robbery I've ever heard of round here was the great train robbery. That's it. That's the one. Yes. <laughs> that was 19 years ago. Yes. Yeah, sorry we're a bit late. <laughs> The chain fell off. All right, all right. <laughs> you, uh, you didn't happen to notice the direction in which they made their escape, did you? What do you mean? Well, they've all been caught, sir. Their sentences have been released. Oh, I see. Flying squad must have beat us to it, then. Yes, they got here in 1963. They don't hang about them lads, do they? <laughs> uh, what we do now, then, Sarge? Well, there's no point in hanging around here, Lomax. We may as well take the evening off. Oh. That new crime play opens in the West End tonight. What, tonight? Yeah, I wouldn't mind catching that. I like a good mystery. What's it called, Sarge? The Mousetrap. <laughs> As you know, campaigning has been going on at Glasgow's Hillhead for the by-election next week. But the pundits are puzzled because, according to the polls currently in the lead, are the don't knows. So, hot foot, we cycled up there to find out why. Pardon me, sir. I really want there. I'm canvassing on behalf of Roy Jenkins here. Hello. And I wonder if you'd mind telling me who you'll be voting for next Thursday. Ah, uh, well, I bet you got Gene Watley, but I'm proponent of your new my bonnet, you know, Jimmy. <laughs> and he go up there and he get the monkey to read down, Jimmy, if I didn't know where you are. Ah, uh, yes, th thank you. Uh, what's he say? Don't know. <laughs> and now we go over to 14 Grumble Gardens for breakfast with Mr. and Mrs. Sarcastic. Oh dear, this porridge is nice, isn't it? Really lovely. This is super, isn't it? <laughs> lovely porridge. Can I have another slice? <laughs> yeah. You being sarcastic? Oh, no, 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 no. This is how porridge is supposed to be, isn't it? If you don't want to eat it, you can always use it as a frisbee. Yeah. You finished with that paper yet? Oh, of course I've finished with it. Of course I have, haven't I? You can always tell when I've finished with a paper because I start reading it. That was a good idea, wasn't it, eh? What a good idea. Changing the lead cup into the milk cup. 
It's really lovely, that, isn't it? That's super, that is. You'd have thought they could have found a sillier name than that, wouldn't you? Oh, oh, I suppose you think it's better having tobacco companies sponsoring these sporting events. I suppose you'd have been happier if they called it the Cough Your Guts Up Cup or the Coronary Thrombosis Cup. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right, absolutely right, aren't you? It's not hypocritical calling it the Milk Cup, is it? I mean, milk's good for you, isn't it? Milk's healthy. Perfect sponsor for football, isn't it? Milk. So you get 22 geezers chasing up and down a football pitch, kicking around a bit of dead cow. Because that's what it is, isn't it? A football lever. It's a bit of dead cow, isn't it? And what do they kick it with? Other bits of dead cow, isn't it? <laughs> it's like cat sponsoring tennis rackets, really, isn't it? <laughs> well, at least it's not a tobacco firm. At least milk can't kill you. Oh, no, 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 no. Of course it can't kill you. It does your power good if some geezer smashes you on the head with a bottle of it, doesn't it? <laughs> Not the point, though, is it? Next thing you know, they'll be sponsoring all the cups, won't they? Eh? You'll have the Playtex Living Girdle Cup. <laughs> the Nasal Decontestant Charity Shield. I don't know why they don't go to the old log and get some sewage firm to sponsor the World Cup. Perhaps they have, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> I mean, it makes you sick, doesn't it? They breeze in, take over a respectable competition, give it a silly name, make a silly trophy, ruin the whole thing. I'll tell you what, the milk marketing board, they've got a lot of, a lot of... A lot of bottle. Too right. <laughs> And what about poor Willie White, Laura? Everybody's saying he's gone soft. I hear he's even been given an advertising contract with Stalk Margarine. <laughs> Let's dispel all these rumours by taking an in-depth look at the private life of the White Laws. Morty, will it? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Um, uh, two, two cups is, is, is a bit excessive. Well, go on. I mean, it is your birthday. Oh, uh, all right, dear, all right. Well, no, 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 cut, 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 cut. What? Who are you? I'm Adrian, your fly-on-the-wall film director. And these are my fly-on-the-wall camera boys. Oh, well, we, we, we can't have this. Too right, we can't. We've got to show the public that you're really tough, Willie Love. Well, how, 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 how do you mean? Well, I mean, for a start, don't just wait for your wife to offer you the tea. Demand it. Demand it. Demand it. <laughs> Are you with me, Trace? Uh, yes, 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 I, 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 I think so. All right, all right, all right. Take two. Roll them. <laughs> Come on, Trace. I, I think I'd like some tea now. That's it, that's it. Nice and butch, oh. love. Come on. Here you are, dear. This is no good. I want it really strong. Oh, bone up. Bone up. <laughs> Humphrey Bogart, remember. Come on, uh, yes, think yes, 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 Come hump, on. Hump. Uh, yeah. and, and Cecilia? What, dear? No sugar. Oh, ma. Oh. Now, look, I want you to take this telephone directory... Uh, yes? ...and rip it in half. What? We well, don't want to be branded as a softie all your life, do you? Oh, well, not really, no. Well, but do I... it, then. Well, all, all right, just the A's. Right. Oh, oh, oh. oh ma. It's all down on film now, Petal. Now, look, just one more thing. Uh, yes, yes. See these six-inch nails? Oh, now, steady on. They've been sterilised. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Willie is a softie, Willie is a oh, that, that, that does it, that does it. I don't know about fly on the wall, but in a moment it'll be fly through the window. Willie! Oh, 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 that'll teach him to call me soft. Oh, help me up off the floor, will you? Oh, and did you see the report this week that said that doctors' receptionists are often needlessly grumpy and ill-mannered, eh? What do you want? <laughs> well, I... I think I may have got, um... hemorrhoids. <laughs> what? I think I may have got hemorrhoids. Speak up! I think I may have got hemorrhoids. Oh, pile! Yes. <laughs> and I suppose you expect me to do something about it? Yes, nurse. Ooh, cancel all my appointments. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that archaeologists have just discovered the remains of Queen Boadicea's main fortress? The headlines eavesdrops on that historic moment. Look, 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 look at this. Look, where? There. This is where they built the outer barrier. That's incredible. 
They must have shifted millions of tons of earth. Yes. How on earth did they manage it? Well, I don't know, but she had to make sure of repelling all borders. I see. see. Oh, what are, what are these here? Well, now that, that is our most exciting find of all. The sharp scythes she used to cut the feet from under all her opponents. Amazing. Dennis, what are these people doing in my kitchen? <laughs> Once more, it's time to dip into the romantic world of a couple in love as we reopen the magnolia pages of Di's diary. Mm, golly gosh, diary. Fancy me finding you again. Such a lot has happened, I can hardly remember it all. Oh, yes. Charles and I have been on another holiday together. And Charles told me he knew of an island where the people just sat around doing nothing all day. And I said, yes, it's called Great Britain. <laughs> and Charles said, no, silly, hadn't I heard of the Bahamas? I said, yes, of course, you wore them in bed. <laughs> I must say, when I got to the island, it was pretty super. Everyone seemed to have got the most amazing suntans. I asked Leroy, our taxi driver, if he'd considered using a lady's barrier cream with a deep cleansing body lotion to protect the open pores of his skin. And he said, frankly, he'd rarely thought of anything else. <laughs> I even got a chance to wear the new bikini Charles bought me. And you can imagine the horror next morning when I opened the sun and learned a beastly photographer had taken my picture. And Charles said he couldn't understand how pictures like that were taken. Well, I said I thought they were probably done with a camera. <laughs> I could tell Charles was pretty angry because he said, I'm pretty angry, and he went bright pink, just like Step Granny's hats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gulp diary. Two of our staff at Highgrove are leaving to get married. Charles said we ought to give them something before they left. And so I said, well, how about their wages? <laughs> oh, gosh, diary, I must dash. Charles is having yet another go at putting the front gate on Highgrove House. Last time he tried, he very nearly took a finger off. And goodness knows what we do for counting then. Bye. <laughs> Oh, what about the terrible weather age? You know, we had one of the hardest winters on record. Played havoc with the football fixtures. And now we go over to Glasgow for the draw for the fourth round of the Scottish FA Cup. Number 12, East Stirling, or Hearts, or Rangers, or Partick Thistle, or Meadowbank. <laughs> Or Clyde, or Berwick, or Airdrie, or Queen's Park will play number six, Celtic. <laughs> or Queen of the South, or Clyde Bank, or Dunfermline, or Dundee, or Wraith Rovers, or Hamilton, or Fawfair, or Hibernian, or Falkirk, or Motherwell, or Aberdeen, or St. Mirren, or Morton. And that's the draw Celtic wanted. With me, Billy McNeil, the Celtic manager. <laughs> Billy, what's your impression? Well, I'm delighted. Disappointed. Confident, happy, worried, terrified, over the moon. Just the one thing we didn't want, just the one thing we did want, don't care, not bothered, it's going to be hard, it's going to be easy. So, so you're looking forward to a tough, easy fourth round match that could go either way? Well, that's in the future, Brenda. But before... <laughs> before that, we've got to concentrate all our attentions on getting through to the third round of last year's cup. <laughs> But it can't all be gloom and despondency, can it? Don't forget, spring's just around the corner. Now spring's in the air, so let's not despair, but welcome the birds and bees. The snow in wilts and men in kilts with icicles round the knees. But love's on the wing once more, Liz Taylor said. Shut the door! Should be, you have to agree that youth is a fleeting thing. I know geriatric, let's do the attrick. 
Marry me, Liz, it's spring. The sky's turning blue. The miners are too, and Gormley is up the spout. Now Arthur's king, it must be spring. His pay packet's bursting out. But Hillhead can beat us all. I've heard the first kicking call. Well, that's not quite true, but how do you do? I'm boy, and I never sing. But I call for clavet, just like a parrot. Vote SDP, it's spring. But let's look ahead, for Maggie and Ted are having a spring affair. Your budget cuts quite drove me nuts. But Ted, you are halfway there. <laughs> it's Mother's Day, Mum. Don't shout. I'm Carol. I'm Mark. I'm out. But it's spring at last, the budget has passed. And beer's not exactly free. But don't sit and mope, there's always some hope for spring 1983. For 1983. Well, that's it, folks. We'll be back again next week, I hope, unless it's my turn to be editor of The Times. <laughs> Bye for now. Those were the news headlines starring Roy Hutt with Chris Emmett, Alison Stedman and the Hudliners. Sketches were by Rob Grant and Doug Naylor, Bob Sinfield, Charlie Adams, James Henry, Jeffrey Atkinson, Roy Adams, Dave Dixon and Chris Emmett. And songs by Richard Quick and Peggy Evans with additional lines by Pete Hickey, John Revel, Ray Binn, Stro Jackson, Mark Edwards, Andrea Solomons and Graham Dakin, Alan Whiteman, Ken Ellis, David Kind, W.B. Saunders, Neil Clark and John Langdon. Who have all signed the petition to bring back the hanging of our producer, Alan Nixon.